Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. I just wanted to acknowledge that this is the one year anniversary for the Woman Warriors podcast. I am so honored and touched by the comments, the reviews, all of the subscribers. Um, Thank you so much for tuning in week after week. It means the world to me. Uh, So happy anniversary. Welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, and today my guest is Marie Celeste. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Winter Springs, Florida. She's a licensed therapist, a group facilitator, speaker, writer, artist, visionary, and space holder for transformation and healing. Today, we're going to be talking about adoption and all aspects of adoption from the trauma of being no longer a part of your birth parents' family to moving on with adopted families and finding identities. Uh, Marie is very willing to share her own story and how she got involved in this therapy practice of helping adoptive families and adoptees find their way through the adoption process. So I, I, uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope you do too. If you live in the Annapolis area and are interested in bringing more mindful awareness into your daily life, I am starting groups for women and men if they're interested around mindfulness, bringing mindfulness into your daily life to help you better connect with yourself, better connect with the people in your life and help you feel more grounded and present and able to live your life with a greater sense of ease. So I hope you'll join me. You can reach out through my website, progressioncounseling.com and shoot me an email if you're interested. There's more information there on the website as well. Click on group therapy and there's a link to this springtime group that begins in March. I hope you'll join us. And now on to the episode. Hi, Marie, and welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Hi, Biz. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I am too. I am super excited to have you and so happy that uh, Marisa sort of connected us together for this venture. Yes. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I would love for you to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and the work you do and how you how you got there? Why are you so passionate about working with adoptees or, you know, adoptee families? Sure. So um, I'm a psychotherapist here in Florida in private practice, and I'm an expressive arts therapist as well. So I do a lot of sand tray and psychodrama and clay and art. And um, I just... How I got here was, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting little loop. I was a teacher for a long time. Mm. And um, at 40, I went back to grad school because I realized that there was such a gap in what I was able to work with in children. Like what I loved about teaching had nothing to do about the math or the science. Um, it had to do with so much more. But there was I was very limited on what I could do from a teacher's perspective. Um, and I loved the work. But it was I just needed to shift it. Mm-hmm. So um, I worked with a lot of kids that were adopted, and that is near and dear to my heart because I am also adopted. So I was feeling a lot of things as well and needed to figure out what was going on with me also. Mm-hmm. So I ended up at 40 going back to grad school and stepping into the therapeutic space. 
and both as a therapist eventually when I graduated and in my own work so that I could really sit with what was going on with me and what was coming up with for me. So the way, the reason why I do the work I do is because it was super hard for me to find someone who really understood adoption, who really understood that it wasn't just something that happened when I was a baby, but it's something that is part of makes up a lot of my experiences. So I needed someone to hear that. Mm-hmm. And that I need to, to go back and, and figure it out because for a long time, I didn't understand that it was a thing. And I don't think a lot of therapists do either. Yeah. So, um, and, and the other piece of it is when I was in grad school, there was practically no training about adoption. I know I was never trained on anything about adoption. Right. In and child development or anywhere. Right. And so it it actually is really interesting when I went back to start doing a little bit of research because it started coming up for me in multicultural class. And, you know, we were talking about our backgrounds and that's where it all kind of started pinging around and shaking my inner snow globes Mm -hmm. because um, I didn't have those answers and Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, what to write on the genogram and those kinds of things. And my professor kept on saying, well, just do your adopted family. But that didn't feel right. Hmm. So, um, I said, I can do my adopted family and I want to know this other thing. Mm -hmm. So when I started talking and saying, Hey, when are we going to learn about adoption? Uh, the answer was, well, you know, it's in this piece or it's in this piece, but there was nothing really that talked about it. So I started doing my own research and it turns out that even though we're as we, I'm saying we as adoptees, since I'm one of them, that we're such a, we're a small population of the people. However, in in our own population, our cultural population, almost 98% of us receive therapy at some point in our life. Wow. And so since that is such a high percentage, it it sad and kind of makes me mad actually that there's not a lot of education about adoption and why adoptees may be seeking therapy in their adulthood um, and why families might need some extra support too. Absolutely. So I started researching it and doing it, and uh, that's where I got here. Um, mm. And about half my practice is not even half, even. It's still a small percentage, but I do um, receive a lot of adoptees, especially adult adoptees. Mm-hmm. Um, but and then the other half is about trauma. So it's an interesting combination that I found myself in because, of course, adoption is trauma. Um, is flows together in this piece of expressive arts, trauma, and then adoption all kind of together. Yeah, yeah. So so you just said adoption is trauma. Now, I'm guessing out there in the listening world, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? Why? What's what's traumatic about adoption? So tell me about that. Sure. Um, so if you can imagine, and I'm going to talk a little bit because there's lots of different types of adoption. There's adoption out of foster care with older children. There is um, family adoption where another family member may adopt a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's infant adoption from foreign countries. And there's infant adoption that's local in our domestic in our country. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone thinks that infant adoption is probably the best. And really what we understand now is the impact that it has on the child, on the infant, is lifelong. Just like all adoption would be, but the difference is when we adopt a child that's like, say, 18 months and has been with its family for a while, Mm -hmm. that child has learned attachment, like it has experienced it. Mm -hmm. Um, When you adopt a child right out of the womb, the child has been in an attachment style, you know, very different, of course, not really understanding because it's in utero, but has some relationship with its mother. And so this baby understands this mother and understands it um, when as soon as the baby comes out, like we know for sure that babies recognize their mother's voices, their smells. They can tell when they're separated. They can tell with their which voice is their mother's voice mm-hmm. and they can sense that. And we know that the reason why babies know how to do that is because of survival. Right. So if you think of it as a survival technique that babies know and understand their mom and moms and have this, all these chemicals that happen and they get connected to their babies, mm-hmm. um, then, then we know that if we separate that, the baby has no idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. We can't explain to an infant, hey, this is in, for your best interest or your mom you know, needs, can't do this right now or right. whatever is happening. Right. The baby cannot yeah. understand that. So what the baby understands is the person that I felt safe with, that I knew that was my only connection, is no longer here. 
And so if we did that and we can see it happen, like with older children, there's a lot of response. A child mm-hmm. will get upset, will cry, will cling, will, will, will want, even, it doesn't even matter if the parent's abusive or not, they want their parent. And that same thing happens to babies, but we just don't understand how to, to hear them mm-hmm. the way that they're speaking that to us. Wow. Yeah. So baby brains are really complex and we don't know that much about them. But what we do know is that when it's been studied, when babies have been put in the NICU Mm -hmm. after they're born and they're being kept by their parents and everything, they've studied that and they know that there is some attachment thing that happens. They miss their parents. Yeah. And so when we take newborns um, away then the, and even if we're placed immediately in the arms of their adoptive parent, there's still something missing. Mm-hmm. And no one actually knows how to experience that with this baby in a safe environment. And we always just kind of pretend like either, okay, you're safe and here I am. And the baby does learn that. But we forget about the fact that there was something that happened in that moment. Yeah, that there was an initial traumatic experience when the baby's mom was not there. And yes. the baby doesn't understand. My Eventually, when I when my birth family found me, I actually had a conversation with my birth mom. And I asked her one year for my birthday, tell me about the day I was born. Because I hadn't didn't know about any of those things. I never heard any of those stories before. Wow. And she was telling me about how after I was born, she actually went to look through the glass to see if she could see me. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't there. And she asked the nurse about it, and she says, oh, the babies that are put up for adoption are in a separate back room. She says, but don't worry. They usually just fall back to sleep. It's almost as if they are waiting for their other parents to come, and they're reborn then. Oh, my gosh. And that was so – that made me feel so much for my baby self and Mm -hmm. other adoptee babies um, that that there is something that happens to babies when they're removed Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're not in the, that space with their mothers anymore. And I don't know that we know enough about it, but I do know that seeing enough of adult adoptees, that it does do something. Yeah. Well, and experiencing and it myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you yourself were adopted as an infant, taken away from your birth mother as an infant. So never knowing that, never having that attachment to your birth mother. Well, I was, um, I was adopted out when I was almost six weeks old, but I was, my mother and I were separated at my birth, Okay. but, um, luckily, uh, my mom, (laughs) my birth mom was very persistent and she ended up being able to see me twice. So she actually held me, uh, she stayed at the maternity home in New Orleans for about 10 days Mm. after I was born and she wasn't able to stay with me the whole time. They didn't let that happen, Mm -hmm. but the social worker that was working with my mom, um, felt for my mom because she didn't really want to do this and uh which most moms don't and uh she brought me to her and she actually was able to hold me for about 30 minutes or so and she said she remembers it always so I kind of think that there's some place in me that knows this because I always grew up knowing that these people that I was loved I always felt that Mm -hmm. by them so um I'm I'm kind of thinking that maybe somehow I knew that Mm. from that experience well, that would be nice to think that you were able to hold on to that and take that with you. Yes. Yeah. So I know you and I, uh, before you know this recorded conversation, talked a lot about um, how adoption impacts your identity. And I'd like to kind of explore that a little bit, both with the, you know, what the birth family is and the adoptive family and how as an adoptee, like you figure that all out. Sure. Well, I am going to use my story a lot. And the reason why I am is because every adoptee's experience is different. And I can't sit here and say that this is true for everybody. Mm -hmm. So what I do know about every adoptee that has been in my presence with me across the, on the couch, across from me Mm -hmm. um, and the people that I just know is that we all have something. There's always something that we, when we get together, we want to talk about it. Um, And there's feelings that are way bigger than a lot of us know how to hold because most people are not holding these things, these feelings of what it was like to, to be relinquished from your family and separated from your original family and what it's like to love your new family that you have. So, and how can you do both at the same time? Mm 
So I can't say that, that the truth is the truth for everybody. But what I can say is that um, everyone that I know has experienced something. And the biggest part of this and the reason why I speak to other therapists regarding adoption and understanding more about it is because the biggest important point to walk away from is that every adoptee has a story. Mm -hmm. They had a story before they knew they had one. So usually an adoptee story starts with when your parents brought you home. But the thing is that they had a whole life before that. And they have people on the other side of that. And if the other therapist can remember that, then I think that helps in general. To no matter where the adoptee's experience is, to remember and just know that this person had something before they entered the family that they had. Mm-hmm. And somehow that's important. Well, and even to to hold that and know that there is this other story, even if the client's not there yet. Absolutely. And I think that what you said was so beautiful, like the holding of it. So it's like kind of like holding space and almost like you're giving permission for when they want to or if they ever want to go to that other space, then it's there. It's Mm -hmm. just the idea of not closing it down, because I think that that was the biggest thing that I needed. And I know that a lot of adoptees when they come into my office also need because they don't know that it's a thing. When you're raised knowing that you're adopted or you're, you you find out early in your life, especially, you know, you it's always part of your life. You don't know what it's like, not like to not be adopted. Right. So you don't understand that it could be impacting your relationships or the way that you show up or, you know, the way you allow people to support you or your businesses or your perfectionism, all these things. And it comes across in general as the word anxiety, but it comes in all these other places. And many, many times that's brought back to this moment of why didn't they keep me? Mm. And what happened? Right. What happened before this? Right. And who who was I? Right. We all had names even before we were adopted. So it's kind of like you have this whole person that you were and then it gets changed and it's, it's confusing. And so if the therapist can just hold space for the possibility of the timeline that happened before the adoption, Mm -hmm. then, because I don't know that any therapist knows because no one will know what that person's experience is like. But even if you know nothing about adoption, if you can just hold the space for that timeline before it so that we can know that I wonder if this goes back to this Mm -hmm. and just be curious as someone's talking about whatever issue that they're experiencing right now, which actually could be something that's from their past. Yeah. And I think what maybe some people might struggle with and what's something that I have worked with clients to understand around attachment is that those infancy memories, you know, the memories during infancy, they're there, even though you're not conscious of what they are, Mm -hmm. that they are very present and a part of you. Absolutely. And part of your body. I mean, we know that. Yeah. And even like, in utero, if a woman, if a woman, a mom is preparing to relinquish their baby, Mm -hmm. then that's something that's happening in her body too. Mm-hmm. And you're experiencing that. So there's a lot of things that can come up that I don't know that we know that much about, yeah. but makes sense. So makes sense. It yeah. just, you know, yeah. And so helping clients, but you too, because you're very open about your own story about finding your identity as an adoptive person, but also owning your story includes everything else that happened before the adoption. How, how do you help clients and how did you help yourself, you know, work to that end? Well, the way that it came up for myself first, and the reason why I'm saying that is because it's through my own work that I figured out um, the way that works best for me and how I support clients in this. Mm -hmm. Um, And what happened with me was that uh, I had a a divine storm in my life. My um, birth family found me out of the blue. Um, I had no idea this was coming. I put my information in a registry, and three years later, I got a random email from who turns out to be my sister. Wow. And uh, it's a whole story (laughs) about what happened, but um, it changed my life. And with it came all these people with all these histories and stories that I couldn't even imagine. And it wasn't all good. 
Yeah. And in fact, it was very sad and, and hurt me to in a lot. And I didn't understand what the hurt was coming from because the story basically is, is that my birth family went through a lot of things and my birth mom and my birth dad separated, but they eventually got back together mm-hmm. and they had other children, but they had them separate with their other spouses. But in the long term of things, my birth father ended up molesting all of my siblings mm. and So my birth father, um, what he's being called right now is a serial pedophile. Mm -hmm. And I, that was not my story. (laughs) That is not what I wanted to hear. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. My whole life as an adopted person, being able to imagine who my parents were, because that's one thing we all seem to have in common is we fantasize who our parents might be. Mm -hmm. And at one time, you know, my father was Dennis Quaid. My mother was Wonder Woman and like they were off saving the world someplace and um, we're going to come back and get me eventually kind of situation. Yeah. So you have this opportunity as an adopted person to make up the exact family that you needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and when my adopted family and uh, like all humans don't show up exactly the way that you want them to, my made up fairy parents could. Mm-hmm. And that got linked to my birth parent. Right. So when I found this out, I was crushed and just heartbroken. And it really stuck on my identity because part of my survival techniques growing up as a child was, well, I'm not really related to these people. So what they're doing, saying, and being doesn't matter because I'm not them. Mm. And that was how I differentiated from what was going on in my life and the traumas that I experienced in my adopted family. And then to find out that the people that actually I was connected to also were very similar to my adopted family broke my heart because that somehow meant something to me. Because I'd always said that, you know, I wasn't part of this because I wasn't genetically related to them. And it turns out I am genetically related to people that are doing similar things. Wow. So my identity went to ground zero. Mm. And then 13 days later, my husband randomly walked out and we ended up getting divorced. Whew. So it was a storm. And oh my it gosh. was a beautiful place that actually I needed to be carried to this space. And it was phenomenal. In the end, it all turned out perfectly, exactly the way it needed to be. But in the moment, my identity, I did not know who I was. I wasn't a wife anymore. My children were leaving for college. My youngest was leaving for college. Mm-hmm. Um, I had just found this out about my birth family. So my made up parents weren't even correct. I didn't know who I was. And I found out my name and that I had a name and that all these other things. And Um, it took a lot for me to really sit with the grief of everything that I was feeling. But the most beautiful thing that came out of it was the only thing that I knew that was for certain was that my body was the same from the moment that I was in relationship with it to now. Mm. And it didn't change. Like my body and I have been here together forever. So my identity had to come from more within me instead of outside of me. Mm. Well, and just as you were describing, like, I wasn't a mom anymore. I wasn't a wife anymore. Suddenly, my, I wasn't the daughter to the adoptive parents that or, you know, the birth parents yes. that I thought I was. That finding that sense of self that isn't this external identity or some other identity, like just who you are, must have been, oh, well, really hard, but an amazing process as well. Completely amazing. And I almost feel like in adoption, and I feel this way with my clients too, as we get back to how I work with them, is I feel like that sometimes they feel the same thing, that they can't lean into really who they are because they put their identity specifically, and I know I did this, I put my identity specifically in, I am the the child of these people over here that I don't know. Mm-hmm. So my identity was just something I didn't have, I couldn't reach because I was separated from my birth family. But the truth really is my identity was inside me the whole time. Yeah. And finding out my and finding my birth family and getting to know my sisters and my brother that and meeting my my birth parents that that had nothing to do with who I am. And the more I met them and had relationship with them, the more I was even more clear about that. Mm. So I think that being adopted um, hurt my identity growing up because I always had it in this fantasy place of it belongs here. And I never really remembered that it belonged in me. Mm. Whereas I think that if you grew up with your biological family, it might be, well, I know I'm related to them, but they're not me because I I feel very different than them. So 
it was a big rush, but it was amazing to get back to that space. And I see that a lot with my clients where they walk in not really knowing who they are. And really what they've been doing their whole life is bending themselves up into a pretzel of who do you need me to be? Because I'll become that. Mm. Yeah, which is we know can be so self-destructive too, if we're constantly meeting everybody else's needs and trying to be the th- something that isn't ourselves. Right. And I think that comes with the territory of being adopted. Mm -hmm. I have not met an adoptee that haven't experienced that. Wow. And I'm hoping, but guessing that there are adoptive stories that the adoptive parents are kind and supportive and helping the child nurture that Mm -hmm. sense of self. But I guess part of that story too has to be like, there's a part of you that began with your birth family. Right. And I do, I've seen some amazing, I've worked with some amazing adoptive parents that have actually reached out to me and said, Hey, we want to do this in a way that's really supportive of our child. And we don't really know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been really honored to have the experience of walking this with adoptive parents as well. And Mm -hmm. really the biggest piece of it is just acknowledging the fact that this is the day that you became part of our family. And we also want to hold space for the fact that you had this life beforehand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the biggest thing that I worked with a adoptive mom and she said, I just want to connect with my child and mother's day and we've never been able to do it. And I said, what do you think is holding you back? And she said, well, I think part of it is me because I know that there's another person out there. Mm -hmm. And I said, what if you just said that? And they had a beautiful experience. The child was like six years old. They went to the river and they actually put flowers in the water for their for her birth mom. Aww. And it made them so close. And I think that's the thing is that when we don't talk about it, it actually puts distance. Yeah. And when we actually are open and talk about it, then it makes us closer. And a lot of adoptive parents say, well, I'm not going to bring it up unless they bring it up. And But I think that a lot of times adoptees are waiting for their adoptive parents to, to, to show them that it's okay to have this conversation that yeah. it needs to be brought up. It can't be secret. No, I would imagine that keeping it secret would be that much. I mean, even if it's just secret in that we don't talk about it, like we know, you know, you know, you're adopted, but the parents are not willing to explore what that means like that would be really difficult for the child right and a lot of times it's it it does get shared but it comes from the perspective of the adoptive parent Mm -hmm. so what did this mean for us you know you were always in our heart this is how we went and got you this is what we wanted we wanted you so bad you were chosen but they never talk necessarily to the child about well i wonder what it was like to be unchosen Mm -hmm. like they never come from a place of curiosity So the biggest thing that I have worked with adoptive families is, is what would it be like for you to come from a place of curiosity, even if this baby was a baby when she was adopted or he was adopted, Mm. you know, just, just because the child doesn't necessarily have the type of memory to remember their body does. So being able to sit in that space of what, I wonder what it was like before Because if we're going to say that someone's chosen, which it actually isn't accurate, babies aren't really chosen. Like we don't go to the store and pick them out kind of thing. (laughs) No. Um, No. The adoptive parents actually choose to adopt and that's more accurate. Mm -hmm. But even if we sit with that idea that, you know, well, you're special because you're chosen, there's something there about what happened before that. Right. You to be there to be chosen to begin with. Mm -hmm. And we have to, we have to make room for that. Just thinking about um, the type of work that, you know, you do with trauma and adoptive families and adoptees, that that expressive work must be, a, I'm imagining, a really big component of that, just helping that yeah. curiosity and unknowns. It's why I got there in there to begin with, because mm. um, I went to a training to do sand tray training. I was going to do like level one, kind of check that off my list. Mm-hmm. And um, we did a sand tray and all of my adoption stuff kept coming into the sand tray. Adoption stuff that I didn't even know that I had. Mm. But because sand tray is such a brilliant way to be able to experience things that are below your words. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it just held it so beautifully and it was safe because it's so contained mm-hmm. because, um, I think that, you know, there's a book called primal wound that's about adoption and, um, it, it's such a primal experience. 
because it does go so far back and it has to do so with such deep feelings. So be able to, ex- to experience it in the sand tray um, is what opened up my door to expressive arts in general. Mm-hmm. And so between psychodrama, which also is another place where I've met other adoptees, which is interesting, it kind of draws us, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, painting and things like that, it's definitely a way because most of the time the children that are adopted are so young, they don't have words. And expressive arts is a way to capture what's going on underneath all that and before the words have been there. So being able to express the feelings that were there before you could talk. Yes. And even just, you know, try to understand the concept, you know, of what it meant. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk about identity, when you're adopted, you, you have, you, there's a line in the sand. You have the before and you have the after. The only thing that's the same is the identity that is yours inside, not the identities that were given to you. Hmm. Um, something I'm curious about, because this is the Woman Warriors podcast, and we do sort of focus on women. I know women in general are often, we have a lot of labels, like I would say, maybe more than men, or we identify more strongly with them somehow. Mm-hmm. Tell me your thoughts about that and how that might impact you know, I think it's interesting that when you when you said that, the first thing that popped in my head, because I have worked with male adoptees, and I've worked with really beautiful male adoptees um, that have gone through similar processes, and we do have a lot of things in common. But I think the difference is that, that I have seen and felt is that women seem to be able to sit in their multi multi dimensionality <laughs> that's a word uh-huh. we're, we're, we're multifaceted right and we're able to sit that in that I think in a different way than men are mm. so um I think that for me as a woman and the women that I've worked with it seems like there's there's a lot more and ability mm-hmm. like we know that we're this and that and this and this and we can hold a lot at the same time Mm-hmm. Whereas the men that I've worked with, it feels a little bit more like it needs to be black and white for them to feel safe. Mm-hmm. So um, the multidimensional aspect of adoption doesn't really, it, it affects them differently hmm. um, in some ways. And then other ways, there are lots of similarities. So, but I think that's the one part. So when you ask that question about women in particular, I think it's the ands. I mm-hmm. think that women are able to look at all the different aspects of their identity in a different way. Yeah. Right. And Mm. statistically men um, seem to not want to be reunited with their first family. um, Mm. And when more women are so statistically, that's a thing too. They even have groups for birth moms who have given up sons um, because they are less likely to be reunited in their adulthood. Wow. So, um, and, you know, statistics change all the time, but for the most part, that seems to be what's happening. And there seems to be a loyalty that happens. They call, they're calling it loyalty, but I don't think it's necessarily loyalty. I don't think that that women who are adopted who want to know more about their birth families are not being loyal to their adoptive families. I think there's a giant, ginormous and there. That yeah. you, can, you can be both. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I talk to parents about this all the time, that if you, do you have multiple children? And they said, yes, I have you know, two kids, three kids, four kids, whatever. I said, do you love them all? And then they look at me like I'm nuts, but I said, yes, I do. I said, so why is it, do you feel like it's impossible for your child to love all their parents? Right. We sort of understand this in the, you know, divorced step parent realm, mm-hmm. right? It, mm-hmm. That children can love all the parents that are involved in their lives. So, you know, children can love more than just their two parents. The most beautiful story I heard about this one time was on somebody's blog that I read. And it was this woman who adopted this little girl and um, her, she had an open adoption. So she had sort of a relationship with the birth parents, but it was only through the adoptive parents. They hadn't seen the, the child and the little girl's birthday was, uh, you know, had a year, she was a year old and her birth mom and dad sent her a card, which her adoptive parents gave her. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those recorded cards where you open it up and you hear a message mm. when they opened it up and the little girl heard the voice of her birth mom. She reacted. She knew who she was. She wow. knew something. I don't know if she knew that she was her mom, but she knew something. It felt familiar. And the adoptive mom sat there and cried and realized in that moment that this needed to happen. And she literally, and I think this, she gets the, the big, <laughs> a big hug from me on this one. <laughs> um, she had a garage apartment, she and her husband. 
and they actually invited the birth mom and birth dad who happened to be still together to live with them and in the garage apartment wow. and have a really impact in, in hands on relationship with their child. Now they were the parents, but they also were an aspect of who this child went to and felt loved by. Wow. And it was amazing because she saw that they still meant something to her. Mm. Boy, that's amazing. That it's takes, amazing. <laughs> that takes a, a very open-minded person to be able to do that. I was just thinking, I don't know if you've watched, uh, Handmaid's Tale. I just finished it. I know everybody else has watched it. And I've seen only it. watched the first two and it, it creeped me out a little bit. So. Oh my gosh. So intense. But premise is there are these women that are the baby makers and yes. basically the minute pretty much after the baby's weaned, the baby goes to this in the story, the real mom, even though it's not the birth mom, um, and is taken away from the the handmaids. But in one of the episodes of the second season, the baby is just not thriving and, you know, in the hospital ready to die. And they're all mourning the loss. And somehow they manage to get the birth mother in and the baby turns the corner and is fine and, and suddenly is, you know, healthy and strong. So that to me, that just reminded me of that scene where everybody wakes up thinking the baby's going to be dead and the baby's giggling and laughing and, the, you know, the mom is holding it and uh, right. it's pretty powerful. And, you know, when I stopped watching it, it was interesting because it was in the very beginning and it, I could sense the tension between the women and the handmaids, right? Yeah. And they didn't like them. And part of the reason why they didn't like them is because they didn't like the fact that they could have babies and they couldn't. Yes. So, you know, we have to go there too, because a lot of, I mean, the way, the reason and all the way the laws are written in re revolving adoption has to do with the adoptive parents. So, you know, when we can really come in from a place of compassion and allow adoptive parents to really share about their feelings about all this, I think that needs to happen because that's the biggest way that we help raise healthy children that are adopted. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of feelings that go into adopting a child and a lot of shame sometimes and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And if we don't allow space for all those feelings and allow parents to go there, then we're really holding them back from the total parent that they can be. Mm -hmm. I worked at a hospital one time and it was almost all adopted children that were, that were there and they were in the residential program. Mm -hmm. And many, many times the parents would tell me not knowing that I was adopted, that, you know, my real child wouldn't do this. And they weren't doing it from a place of spite. They were doing it from a place of hurt and they were sad and they didn't know what to do, but the adoption gave them an out mm. an out that having a biological child doesn't always give you. And so, you know, it was such a beautiful thing for me that these parents just kind of got on their knees because they said in the outside world, people were like, Oh, you adopted a child. What a wonderful person you are. You saved this person, this, this, and that. But the truth is none of that's true. You know, adoptive parents adopt kids because they desperately want to be parents. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily doing it for the children because no. really what's in the best interest of the children is to be with the families that they were a part of, but to make sure that that's healthy. But it doesn't always work out that way. And, you know, if we can just be really honest and truthful about why parents are adopting so that they can sit with their feelings and their shame and their all the, the, the grief that they have for their unborn children then I think that they can be such beautiful and wonderful parents to their adopted ones. Yeah. I feel that so much. Yeah. But yeah. So yes, I would imagine that there's shame and guilt and all those feelings on both sides of whether you're choosing to give up your child for whatever reason, or you are adopting and can't have children or are opting not to for whatever reason. Yeah. Yes. My, um, I have red hair and when my, my mother is my adopted mom is, has olive complexion and she's got dark hair. Hmm. And when and my mom shares the story with me, cause honestly I can't remember it. When they laid me in her arms, she said, this baby has red hair. Do you have another one that looks like me? Hmm. And you know, my mom thinks it's funny, but it's just one of those very small micro moments where, you know, there was a distant, there was a disconnect. Yes. Um, and obviously <laughs> they didn't have another one cause I was still there, but, <laughs> um, but forever people would ask, Oh, where does your daughter get her red hair from? And my mom would make up different stories. Oh, well my grandmother has, 
you know, reddish tones to her hair and this, that, and the other. But she never came out and said, well, she's adopted. We're not sure. Wow. And that's all I actually needed. I needed that, those words to be said, you know, I needed to hear my mom be okay with the fact that I came from somewhere else yes. and we don't know, you know, these things. So, yeah. you know, in, in the families that I support that are biracial, you know, and they've, they've adopted children outside of their particular race, they have to be able to do that. Mm. Right. Yes. But if you adopt children that sort of look like you are, you are somewhere in that realm, you know, you don't. Mm. And so it's kind of, it's interesting how, um, how would that, we have to look at all of it. Absolutely. And there are a lot of feelings that are involved. And sometimes it's, wait, this kid doesn't look like me. Mm. Well, that reminds me, um, just as we wrap up, you had mentioned to me in our initial conversation about how people use the term adopted and that it can be used in a hurtful way and that we don't call people out on that. Like, I'm like, well, oh, you must have been adopted. Well, like, why do we let people say things like that? Right. Well, I mean, you know, when people tease each other about that, you know, and mm -hmm. families tease their, their children about that. And then there's, you know, the movie, The Avengers, mm. um, where there's a scene where um, Thor is, and Loki are there and Loki's, I don't know, killing people, doing whatever. And people say, you know, to Thor, your brother is killing all these people. And he's like, well, he's adopted. Mm. And the thing is, is that, it was one thing that the, that the character said that is another thing of watching as I watched the audience response, which was with laughter. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, as if they said, oh, well, he's gay or he's Asian or anything like that, it would, no one would think that's okay. Right. You know, we're out of space in our world, thank goodness, that we know that these things aren't okay. Mm -hmm. But yet this is still allowed. So, yeah. you know we have to stop people from saying that and using it as a term of you're not okay. I mean, I have the adoption piece and this redheaded stepchild words. So, um, <laughs> I'm a little double whammy in that area, but, um, you know, we, we, we need to stop using adoption as a way of disconnection. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. I, uh, we had a running joke in our family, you know, a joke in quotes, mm -hmm. It must be because you're the adopted one that you're, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I can remember saying to my sister, you know, I'm one of four, but saying to my sister later in life, like, you know, I, I don't want to say that anymore. That does not feel good to me. And I don't want you to say it about me, but I just don't want that to be the joke anymore. Right. Right. It seems to be like there's two ends. There's one end where adoption is this wonderful thing. And we're so lucky because we chose you as the rainbows and unicorns view of it. And then there's this other side where we use it in passing as a joke. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's and, and that affects people. And when they come and sit on my couch, they, they say that like there are a lot of times that they don't want to say that they're adopted. Or what does that mean? And the biggest thing that I see in every single one of my adult adoptees that come in and mention, you know, I'm adopted. So I'm, you know, I'm wondering if that has something to do with how I'm feeling is they all of a sudden get really small. So as soon as they say those words, they go from being this adult, successful, you know, person to being this child that's sitting across from me on my, on their couch. Mm. And it's almost just with the word. Yeah. So it makes people very small in their small space. Mm. And I think partially it's because we don't really talk about everything that's involved in what adoption is. Yeah. I was in Bali one time and, and I talked to a local about, about adoption because I was doing a lot of research and he didn't understand what the word meant. It didn't translate. Hmm. And so into Balinese. And so I, <laughs> I had explained to him and he was so confused. He's like, wow. I don't understand. Who, well, why has this happened? Wow. And, and you change their name. Like, like it was very confused. It just doesn't happen. And in other countries, uh, adoption is treated very differently. Australia has just changed all their laws. Wow. Um, we're a little far behind on, we're just still now opening records because most people don't even know that our birth records are sealed. If it's a closed adoption, especially during certain time periods of uh, history. Mm -hmm. And we don't have, like, I don't have a right to my records, even though I'm almost 50 years old. I don't have a right to see my original birth, birth records. Wow. That's right. crazy. Yes. So we're kind of, it's interesting how far behind we are in this area. Hmm. Good to know, though. That's an interesting uh, thing I did not know. 
Yeah. And you know, a lot of therapists, I've had adoptees come and sit and with me and they'll say something like the, they get exasperated because the count, the therapist will just say something to the effect of, Oh, well, if you want to know who your parents are, why don't you look at your birth certificate? <laughs> like it's not on there. We have amended birth certificates. They're rewritten. <laughs> wow. Right, right, right. It's not that easy. It's not like it's I just can easy. go decide what to do. It's not not right. A, so, a you know, I always tell people, if you have someone that you, they have put on their form that they're adopted, go do some homework first. Yeah. Well, you know, understand a little bit what the laws are, because a yeah. lot of times it makes people feel unseen and unheard even more because we always have to explain things. Yeah. So if someone can come in and say, um, yeah, I get it. It must be really frustrating. You know, is your, is your state one? Do you have ability to see your birth certificate or not? Just ask the question. You don't have to know the laws. You can just ask the question. Yeah. Are you able to, you know, see it? Have the knowledge that maybe they can't. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Marie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I This has been um, just a very eye-opening conversation for me, but I want people to know how to find you and if there are things coming up in your world that you would like them to know about. Sure. Well, first of all, Biz, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor when people reach out and say, hey, we want to know more about adoption mm. because um, it just – it it brings tears to my eyes because a lot of times people don't want to know more. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I really appreciate that. And I know for the people that I work with having more therapists out there that understand even enough to know that there's a story before their story, yeah. um, is enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know everything. So I really appreciate, um, you having me and allowing me to share some of my story and how I work with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so getting in touch with me, I my website is mariecelest.me, um, or you can email me at info at mariecelest.me. Nice. Um, and one of my favorite things that I do is retreat work. So I have a I have groups that I do in my office, but I extend it to longer because they kept on saying, we need more time, we need more time. <laughs> you know, between, between my clientele begin combination of adoption and trauma, you know, we time is what we need. <laughs> Yes. Time and space to actually be able to kind of go deep. And so I have a couple of retreats coming up. I always have retreats uh, in the making. So anytime you want to contact me, if anyone's ever interested in retreat work, I work with a lot of therapists actually too. Um, and going kind of in that space where giving yourself permission to go deep and explore through expressive arts and group work. Uh, I do it right now. I've been uh, going back and forth between Asheville in the mountains uh, and the beach here in Florida. Oh, so wow. I have that coming up. I have a one day event coming up as well. Um, so all that information you can find on the website. Well, and I will include all the links in the show notes. Are there resources out there that you feel like would be important for the listeners to know about? So this is the saddest part of what my answer has to be because people ask me that all the time. Mm -hmm. And the answer really is, I don't know of that many. Mm -hmm. So there is a book that everyone kind of refers to, but it's a hard book for me to send people to because mm -hmm. it's not written by an adoptive person. It's written by an adoptive mom and she honors the adoptive process very well. Um, and the book is called the primal wound mm. and it kind of talks a little bit about it, but unfortunately there's not a lot out there about adoption. My thing is always just ask the person yeah, because they're going to know more about their experience. And because, um, because adoption affects people differently and because a lot of people have a lot of different stories about it, just be really open to their whole story and, you know, ask them because they have all the answers. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, I look forward to talking to you hopefully again in the future. Thank you. And I hope that as well. It was great talking with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks again for tuning in to the Woman Warriors podcast. I really enjoyed talking to Marie. She is a very uh, compassionate person. And I feel like that compassion really came out here in the interview. And I feel as if adoption is an area where we really maybe we take it for granted the impact that it might have on the kids and that and the families and this is something that needs to be talked about and paid more attention to so 
Thank you, all you listeners, social media followers, subscribers. I appreciate your support and continued presence in my life. I hope you have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to the Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com.